I actually don't know if I've said any words out loud today. So this is gonna go really well. <laughs> hey friends, welcome back to my channel. How's it going? Hope you're doing really well. Hope you're having a lovely day. I hope life and all its things are falling into place for you like a neat little jigsaw. And uh, I hope everyone's being nice to you. <laughs> Today I thought we would get up close and personal with, you might be able to hear that, this little stack on my right here. Uh, I say little stack. It's actually quite a tall stack and also that makes it sound like I'm about to talk about pancakes. <laughs> kind of wish I was about to talk about pancakes but instead I am about to talk about this to my right just over here. This would be the physical manifestation of why my bank balance took quite such a hard battering and a clobbering uh, in the Waterstones Boxing Day sale. <laughs> I think it's been the last couple of years now that I can kind of remember anyway that Waterstones seem to do this great sale straight after Christmas now where for like three days only it's half price across all hardbacks. Uh, it's kind of too good to be true. I think actually for a lot of people it was too good to be true <laughs> and it seemed like up and down the country different Waterstones were just kind of doing their own thing. Some were just doing like a normal sale across some books but I was super lucky in that our local Waterstones decided, hey presto, happy Christmas. I know you know where I'm going with this. When someone presents you with an offer like that, when someone presents you with an offer you can't refuse, then who am I to turn them down? Who am I to send them packing, you know? Saying that as well, I kind of love the idea that there's this group of elite booksellers sitting around a round table at Waterstones head office somewhere that are like, Let's make them an offer they can't refuse. <laughs> Half price hardbacks. And in turn that's meant that this this lot right here have basically turned into my TBR for the foreseeable. Um, and hey, we're all in the same boat around here. And that boat is sinking at a, an alarming rate under the weight of our TBRs. And we're all going down with that ship. Also I'm not entirely sure what I've done wrong but I've definitely curled my hair wrong today. It's it's doing something very wrong um so we're just gonna we're just gonna ignore that okay kicking things off let's start right at the top of the pile this is things we do to our friends by heather darwin when i tell you i am so excited to read this i'm enjoying my current book but i am kind of like counting down the pages because i feel like this is gonna be what i'm gonna reach for next and this was described to me as for fans of the secret history and if we were villains it is dark academia university setting toxic female friendships it's also set in edinburgh that that is perfect fine take my card fine so claire arrives at the university of edinburgh and she is so ready for a blank slate and a fresh start she has also bought with her this huge secret which she's kept entirely to herself but she's going to use this as an opportunity to restart everything begin again and become the person that she feels she was always supposed to be and then at university she meets tabitha who is this incredibly charismatic really likeable, stunningly beautiful, and also incredibly rich girl. And it doesn't take long for Claire to be sucked into this whole new world that she's never experienced before. She's suddenly surrounded by these enigmatic friends who she just can't get enough of. They sip champagne on the rooftops through the summer. They skip off to France for their holidays. It's a whole new world and it's the fresh beginning that Claire was looking for. But then once she is sucked into this whole new world, Tabitha reveals that there is a little secret project that they're working on. It's a project that they need Claire's help with and it turns out that she can't say no because they know what she did. They know the secret. I feel like I'm such a sucker for reviews on the back but these ones say sizzling with tension and intrigue, a deeply compelling story of friendships turned rotten. Darwin's prose is like a fine dark silk shivering on your skin. Hello! I really don't know where I heard about it or how it has even made its way onto my TBR but I, I mean I can only assume that the universe has brought us together because this sounds like a perfect book. <laughs> um, and also this cover is unbelievable. Next up we have Night Crawling by Layla Motley um, which has indeed crawled its way onto my TBR unexpectedly. I saw a girl making a TikTok where she was recommending her best books of 2022. She was comparing them to the ones that won the Goodreads Awards last year and she was saying what she would have chosen for each category. She basically said that she couldn't believe this hadn't 
won the category that it was nominated in because it was one of the greatest books she'd ever read. I don't know who she was, I don't know anything about her tastes, her life story, her demographic, but you know when you just hear someone talk about a book, this is probably quite a strange thing to say, you just hear someone talk about a book and it scratches a part of your brain that is just right. It's like a, it's like a proper little scratch on your brain and you're like, that's for me, that is for me, I have to read that now. So this one is all about Kiara, she's only 17 but she definitely doesn't have the life of a normal 17 year old. Um, her mum is in rehab, her older brother is literally only concerned about spending all of his time and money on trying to become a rapper. She's had to do what she always said that she wouldn't do and she's taken to the streets in an effort to try and keep her family afloat, to try and make some money and support her family. But unfortunately it basically does the very opposite of that and it pulls her into, I think it says like, the darkest corners of the adult world. So I know this is going to be a pretty dark, quite gritty story. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, pretty grim reading at times but I know that it's meant to be a really powerful one as well and I'm looking forward to that aspect of it. I actually saw a review for this that said it will leave you in a cold, clammy terror, which isn't a phrase that I thought I would find appealing, but here we are. I spent most of my time cold and I'm also quite clammy, so. Next up we have Careering by Daisy Buchanan. I love this cover. If that isn't all of us. <laughs> I was actually sat next to this author at an event I went to years ago now, like 2017, 2018 maybe, um, which was called the Cosmo Blog Awards, I think. That sounds really old school now, but I mean, it was a while ago. But one of the highlights of the evening was that I was sat next to this author and she was so lovely. I was like a little bit starstruck because I've read her columns and her like online writing for years and they're always so entertaining. I think I did manage to keep my fangirling quite well under wraps. I was quite well behaved I think but she was so lovely and awesome and hilarious and quite an inspiring person in my kind of career. Um, so I've been meaning to read one of her books for a really long time and there's another one I think which is called Insatiable but I decided to go for this one because it was really calling out to me. <laughs> when I say calling out to me it is like almost almost too loud. <laughs> like this is almost too on the nose for experiences that I went through in my 20s honestly but nevertheless <laughs> this is described as a hilarious dark comedy about two magazine employees who stage a chaotic rebellion against the jobs that have sucked them dry. <laughs> so Harry has poured her whole life through her 20s into her 30s for this job that she has at Panache magazine. She's sacrificed friendships and her social life, you know, slowly losing her sanity as a result, but she knows it'll all be worth it because a job in a magazine industry is precious stuff. And then meanwhile, the other main character is Imogen, who is still at the point of really trying to like hustle her career in order to desperately make it work. She's done a million internships and all she wants is to be able to write for magazines. But it seems like the fairy tale career might not be the job that she always thought it was going to be because as she's pouring more and more of her heart and soul into writing for these magazines, it becomes very clear that the magazine doesn't care whether she sinks or swims as a result. Almost too relatable there. I hope there's some good humour in here because otherwise this is going to be a little painful bop on the nose to read. Um, Oh, wonderful flashbacks to being made redundant from my dream job when I was 25. The best of times. I just think it seems like it's going to be a really great, quite punchy and witty kind of deep look into that toxic line that a lot of us walk just to be able to say that we're holding down our dream jobs. Uh, this cover honestly just makes me feel really uncomfortable. There is something about that that is so unsettling. Even just the look of this makes me quite nervous to start this reading experience. And I know, I know, I've seen I've seen some reviews and I know I really need to buckle up for this one. So this is Lapvona by Otessa Moshveg. If you haven't seen this particular book before, then I bet you will have seen another one from this author um, who wrote, I think it's called my year of rest and relaxation. I've basically seen a lot of very intriguing reviews for this story. It is constantly described as being incredibly disturbing, depraved and revolting and really messed up, very very dark. Which as I say is very revealing for one's character but for me that that really just makes me want to see what this is all about. <laughs> 
cute unsettling eyebrows. But it's not just that, this is also set against this kind of backdrop of like quasi-medieval middle ages type setting which for for some reason I, I just find like a very like I was talking about the brain scratch before, there is something about that kind of backdrop to a story. This is meant to be very kind of macabre and brutal um, and this this isn't like uh oh, spoopy doopy fun times a fun little scare uh, like it's, it's a really dark story and the main character is 13 year old Marek um, he's the abused and delusional son of the village shepherd. He never knew his mum and his dad told him that she died in childbirth. But Marek does have this special bond with the blind village midwife, Ina, um, and she nursed him from a child as she does kind of with all the children in their village. But as well as just kind of doing her day to day and looking after the children of the village, she's also got some very special abilities and she can communicate with the natural world. And I quote, suddenly, new and occult forces upset the old order. By year's end, the veil between blindness and sight, life and death, the natural world and the spirit world will prove to be very thin indeed review from the New York Times on the back that says the sentences are piercing and vixenish and it's now my new life goal to just once be described as piercing and vixenish. What do I gotta do to be vixenish huh? So yeah I'm basically equal parts excited and terrified to read this book. You might recognise this awesome cover. Um, I actually have you guys to thank for this one because in basically all of the recent book videos that I've done for the past handful of months, whenever I ask for book recommendations, this always comes up over and over and I'd heard of it and I'd kind of, I'd made a note of it because the reviews have been really good, but it wasn't one that was kind of jumping out at me. And particularly it came up so much in my last video, which was my favourite books of 2022, so many of you, I think this is probably the most popular answer, so many of you suggested this one. So this is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabriel Zavin, or Zavin, and I just, I have a feeling that this is going to be a really beautiful, special story. Let me tell you what it's all about if you're not familiar with it. So we start with two kids who meet each other in a hospital room in the 80s. One of them is there visiting their big sister and the other is recovering from a car crash but they instantly bond over their shared love of video games. But before they know it, very quickly, that time is over, their meeting kind of fades into memory and their friendship goes along with it. But then, as fate would have it, as these things happen, eight years later, they bump into each other, they spot each other across a very busy kind of crowded train station. They're instantly catapulted back to that moment that they hit it off and they had this like immediate bond. And once again, the spark between them is like instantaneous. And together they start to work on what they do best. They both start creating video games. This is the story of the perfect world Sadie and Sam build, the imperfect world they live in and of everything that comes after success. Money, fame, duplicity, tragedy. Someone ring the coming of age alarm. I see tears in my future. I see falling in love with beautifully written characters that feel all too real. I see me inevitably having a small emotional breakdown, probably when one of them dies. I can see it now. It just seems to be one of those books that's really taken people by surprise. It, every review people are like, oh, I picked this up because it sounded interesting and I fell madly in love with it and I've never felt this way about a book in my life. So not strictly a hardback, but I did pick this up on the same little shopping spree. Um, this is Atlas 6 by Ali... I thought it was Olivia. Now that I'm looking at it, it's not Olivia. That is a real Mandela effect to me. I would have bet 10 million pounds that that was written by Olivia Blake. So this is a book which has been hanging over me for a while. It always pops up on the kind of like recommended reads if you're into dark academia books. And I've worked my way through a lot of those books now, but this one has for some reason evaded my grasp until now. Not that I'm going in with high expectations or anything, but I am kind of expecting to love this book with the fire of 1000 suns. So this one we're stepping into a whole world of magic and history and ancient secrets and ancient knowledge and secret societies. I love me a secret society, can't get enough of them. That makes it sound like I'm in one. I'm not in any secret societies, although that does sound exactly like something someone in a secret society 
would say. This is quite like a beloved book these days. I know it's written with kind of like a lot of really rich imagination. There's a lot of like smart magic systems in here, which I always really enjoy, as well as a network of kind of really great characters that people fall head over heels in love with. So this one is all about the elite Alexandrian society. Its members enjoy a lifetime of power and access to ancient secrets, but only five places are offered. So after recruitment by the mysterious Atlas Blakely, the candidates must complete a rigorous year of arcane study. Those who do manage to earn a place in the society can expect a life of wealth and power and unrivaled knowledge, prestige beyond their wildest dreams. But then as the tagline says, six are chosen, only five will walk away. So the stakes are high. It's up to them to prove that they are worthy and that their magic is worthy of acceptance into this society. To me, this sounds like a magical Hunger Games, which I'm very into the concept of. So all in all, I am basically ready for this to become my new personality. This was the one that went straight into my basket before anything else. This is I'm Glad My Mum Died by Jeanette McCurdy. Um, when I say I have been meaning to read this for the longest time, but for one reason or another, you know when books just like keep overtaking and you're like, well, hang on, I really want to read this and then something else pops up and you, you just never get through it. But whatever happened, I now feel like the biggest fool for not picking this up sooner because I've actually just finished reading this. Um, I actually read it in two sittings and it is my first five star book of 2023 because I just thought this was amazing. This is a memoir and I'm sure you will have seen it everywhere. It's become kind of a bit of a sensation and it's written by Jeanette McCurdy. If you don't know her, she's an actress. She was really popular in some Nickelodeon shows. Her Nickelodeon days must have been like the generation after mine. Like I was all about Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Keenan and Kel and I think like iCarly and Sam and Cat, which are her big ones, they were kind of like the generation after. This is basically her story of growing up as a child star and alongside that kind of most influentially the struggle of the control that her mum had over every aspect of her childhood and her growing up. In this story there is everything you can think of pretty much. There is traumatic abuse, there is serious mental health problems, eating disorders, addiction, toxic family relationships, toxic romantic relationships. There is just all of these quite unbelievable, incredible life hurdles that she goes through and every single one is just explored with the most like ruthless, completely unflinching honesty, like a total look back at her life with so much honesty and this real kind of like self-confrontation of everything that she went through. It doesn't feel like a sad, miserable look back at lost years. It feels like it's just full of empathy and reflection and so much sensitivity but then also this really like wicked humour in there as well. As I said, I literally read this in two sittings. I found it riveting Something about child star stories I find so fascinating anyway, but this in particular was just so well written, um, I honestly couldn't put it down. I would just like to add some like huge red flashing trigger warnings to this though. I mean, it pretty much speaks for itself that there's going to be some really difficult things to read in here. There's a lot of quite difficult subject matter. Obviously the grief aspect is huge, but there's abuse, there's addiction, mental health problems, and a lot of the eating disorder reflection in this book I found incredibly difficult to read. Let me tell you, I had some moments <laughs> reading this, so if that is something that's that is particularly kind of like a, a sore bruise to you. Have a little look maybe beforehand before you dive into this one if you think you might struggle with it. Um, it didn't take away though from how much I enjoyed this book. In fact, it probably just made me connect with it more. I have also read this one since picking it up. I couldn't resist this. It was calling out to me. Lucy, give me a little read. This is The Skeleton Key by Erin Kelly. That is quite a tongue twister, The Skeleton Key by Erin Kelly. So this is a good old fashioned thriller and I haven't read a good old fashioned thriller for a really long time and I so enjoyed being like sucked back into that genre. But I actually didn't pick this up at all for the thriller aspect. I didn't really realise that was such a, a main part of this story. I actually picked it up because I was so intrigued by the setup that that thriller is set against. So our main character is Nell and she's come back to her family home 
for a huge anniversary that they're all celebrating but it's not your standard anniversary it's because 50 years ago her dad wrote a book called the golden bones which is part poetry part picture book part treasure hunt so those 50 years ago this book the golden bones was released it was a huge success it became like a cultural reset an absolute phenomenon and it developed this like really obsessive cult following who absolutely live for this book it's all about a murdered woman called eleanor who after she's killed her bones her skeleton is scattered across hidden locations across the country there's clues hidden in the words and the pictures which reveal the location of where her bones have been buried and so this cult obsessive following are trying to solve these clues hidden in the book so that they can go and dig up these bones and now at this point 50 years on all of the bones have been found and dug up and collected except for one which is the pelvis but Nell has really suffered as a result of it because these fans became so kind of obsessive um, and stalkerish but for this 50th anniversary Frank the author decides that he's finally going to reveal the whereabouts of the final bone and it's this which leads to all hell <laughs> breaking loose. So I thought that premise as soon as I read that I was like that is unbelievably good. I was just so intrigued I thought that was so unique so unusual so compelling I could not wait to read. I did really enjoy reading this but it wasn't really the story that I was expecting it to be. I actually think what I wanted to read was the story of like people solving those mysteries and finding those bones and like the slight kind of like madness and obsession around that. I think maybe that's what I wanted to read but in actual fact what this is is a thriller that surrounds the family and the author and his family and how the book has affected them. It's a really really clever very intricate plot um, which I wasn't like captivated by at the start but as it continues there's so many twists and turns such an unexpected ending not what I thought was going to happen at all um, so I really appreciated that and although it might not have been quite what I thought it was going to be quite not quite what I anticipated it was going to be it's a really great twisty clever whodunit thriller and last but not least I'm sorry if I have gone a little bit dark it's literally in the time I've been talking it's literally gone dark outside so <laughs> probably means I need to shut up. So this last one is a book that was actually very kindly sent to me um, as an early advance copy by the publishers so just full disclaimer I was sent this one. This is The Cloisters by Katie Hayes and I genuinely think this might be one of the most beautiful book covers I've ever seen. Let me give you a little close up. Look at that. It is literally stunning. So main character Anne, she rocks up in New York City, she arrives expecting to spend her summer working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There's like a big admin complication when she gets there so instead she ends up being assigned to the Cloisters which is a gothic museum and like selection of gardens that's really kind of renowned and revered and respected for its collection of renaissance and medieval art and artifacts and collections and it doesn't take long until unsuspecting Anne is pulled into this small circle of charismatic but very kind of mysterious enigmatic academics and professors and researchers who all seem to be harboring their very own secrets against this gothic mystery backdrop. There's Rachel who also works as a researcher at the Cloisters, there's something that seems to not be quite as it seems with her and then there's also Patrick, he's kind of the main one, he's the museum's main curator and he's got this kind of quite overwhelming obsession with the history of tarot and tarot cards and he is absolutely convinced that unlocking the well-guarded secrets around the history of tarot could be the key to unlocking secrets about contemporary fortune telling as well so it's this kind of like very atmospheric quite tense gothic thriller interwoven with this idea of tarot and how fate and choices can kind of sit next to one another and whether you kind of believe in fate or whether you believe everything is a string of decisions. A whole bunch of like dark enigmatic academics up to no good, yes please, but then throw in like the aspect of tarot, tarot cards, tarot magic as well, that is a delicious combination. I did enjoy this, it is absolutely worth a read 
um, if that is like ticking a few boxes for you you'll definitely enjoy this but I think actually similar to the skeleton key as well this is much more of a kind of real life realistic thriller like the dynamics of people the relationships between them rather than anything that kind of leans into magical realism or much of a focus on the tarot itself or any kind of real like fantasy fate element there. The aspect of tarot in this isn't as significant as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to play a much bigger part in like kind of predicting fates and futures. So I think it's a really great story idea. I love the kind of mixture of elements combined in this. It's just a different execution to what I was expecting. Um, so yeah. And also the literally can we all agree that the word cloisters is maybe the worst word of all time cloisters cloisters well it is officially now pitch black outside this looks like a different video <laughs> to how the setup looked when i first started filming this so i can only assume it's gonna be a long one if you made it this far congratulations and i thank you <laughs> hope you enjoyed seeing what i picked up in the waterstone sales i hope this has given you maybe a little bit of inspo for your next read let me know what you're reading at the moment. Let me know what the last great book you read was. Don't forget you can find me over on Goodreads and Storygraph as well. They are both always linked in the description box down below. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate your company and I will see you very soon with another video. Bye!